Hello, welcome to the uh, Manchester Metropolitan University Philosophy Society podcast. Today we have Fran, she's here to talk about her essay, which was very good, you know, it was very good to read. It was about uh, AI. And it's the only essay that I've ever read which ended with a kiss. (laughs) (laughs) Can you please explain your decision to put a kiss on the end of your essay? I just think... Alan Turing deserves a little, you know, at the end. Just thought all his work, just, just. You know, um, he went through so much as well, so he fully, like, you know, for for all the shit he's gone through, he fully deserves that, like. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was nice to add it. Maybe that'll cut some of it. (laughs) Mm, Exactly, exactly. I wish more academics did that, you know. I wish more academics, like, you know, ended, like, so let's say, um, let's say you have, like, Dom, like, Dom or whatever, who's super into Heidegger. I wish he ended, like, some of his Heidegger texts with a um, lovely Heidegger X. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice, though. It makes it more like a conversation through time rather than mm-hmm. just, like, you know, scholarism or whatever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Less formal. Yeah. All right, let me, I'm going to quote you here, right? This is a quote from you. Mm -hmm. Arguably, one thing is necessary for the phenomena of experience, the ability to think. Now, that confuses me because does that mean that animals can't experience because they can't think? Like, what do you mean by think? How would you define thinking? Do you not think that animals can think? No, I do. But like that you said, because your essay was titled, Can Machines Think? And I think Mm -hmm. it's important to define thinking because in that quote you say, arguably one thing is necessary for the phenomena of experience, the ability to think. Now, it would seem to me that in order to think, you need to experience rather than in order to experience, you need to think. So maybe you could explain to us what you mean by thinking. I feel like our response to experience is thinking. If like we experience things and then we think, I don't know it's um yeah you're right to be fair I think you do need to experience things and then you think about them (laughs) I did write this in first year as well I want to like just say (laughs) yeah I I think you're right there Mm. (laughs) to play play devil's Africa um you can like you know have thinking even if you don't fully experience and stuff like you do still need thinking to experience you know like um I mean you can't need both it's not like one comes before the other it's more like it's like something working in tandem yeah like you need you need to think about something to fully experience it because let's say I couldn't think but I have something placed in front of me like that's not going to be me experiencing anything it's just going to be something being placed in front of me but the ability to think helps me experience that thing. But what about animals? When you say think, you mean like like a voice in the head kind of thing, like a like thoughts, like like uh, phrases that appear. Like because animals can't think, but surely they can still experience. I don't think they can. You don't think animals have an experience? I think they can think. I think animals could think. Well, in words. Not everyone. Not everyone thinks in words, do they? No. So if, if some people think in pictures and like some people think in just kind of like it, like experience but in their head. Because I remember there was a whole conversation a while ago on like social media, whether you think in words or think in um, images instead. Mm. Um, so maybe they just think in a different way, but it's still, you know, it's kind of digesting phenomena and digesting experience. But even when you're just kind of chilling out and you're not really doing anything, you're still thinking, aren't you? And I feel like without that ability to think, you wouldn't be quite experiencing the phenomena around you. Otherwise, you'd just kind of be existing, you know? So animals must be able to think. Mm. Like, like, one thing I would say is that, um, you know, the only stuff that doesn't really think is stuff that doesn't really have a brain. So, like, let's say oysters and stuff, like clams, because they don't have the brain. They don't have, like, you know, cerebral cortex or whatever like they don't they don't think but even if like animals that think on that basic level so let's say dogs don't think in words 
but they still think they still think that you know oh I love my owner oh I want food oh I want belly bob so I don't think you can say animals can't think I think you can say there's levels to this shit and humans kind of think on another like plane because they think in language mm. so the question is can machines think mm-hmm. so maybe you could give a little introduction to that concept and like because you talk about the Turing test and and whether yeah. that is a good test Maybe it could explain the Turing test a little bit. Yeah, sure. Um, it's quite interesting because Alan Turing um, proposes like the Turing test or the imitation game as like a, an alternative to the question whether machines can think because he's just like, it's too difficult to define the word think. So instead, we're just going to play this game and then like that's going to prove whether or not they can think. And basically it's where there's an interrogator in one room And then in two separate rooms, there's a man and a woman. And then both of the people in the other rooms are sending him signals or like however they do it through a computer to say, I'm the woman, you know, it's me that's the woman, not not the other one, they're a man, um, to try and convince the interrogator. And then Turing says, let's swap one out for a machine. And then the person now has to convince the interrogator that they are the human and not the machine and then the machine has to convince the interrogator that they're the human and not the machine which is quite it just sounds mad doesn't it like (laughs) I don't know how he came up with that um as an alternative to the question but I do think um I don't I don't think it would prove that machines could think even if you do trick the interrogator into believing that the machine is the human Mm. I don't think that that would prove that machines can think. I just think it would prove that the machine is very, very clever. Because even now, like you get some robots that you can have conversations with, like those ones in Japan where like it mm. looks like a woman and you can talk to it and stuff and it'll reply to you. But it doesn't yeah. really prove because it seems to me the question is like not can machines think, but like are machines conscious? Do they have like an inner experience? And I'm yeah. not sure that even if you put a human being in the Turing test, that they would be able to pass because how would you even know that a human being wasn't just a zombie? kind of thing exactly yeah yeah and well I mean you, you talk to Siri and like the the Google and Alexa they all have conversations with you but that doesn't mean that they're thinking it just means that they have a list of phrases that they know how to respond to and that's very different from thinking I think it makes me think that we've misunderstood like there's something wrong with the way we're thinking about it like how we attribute experience to a brain and we say, oh, it's the brain that's having the experience. And so is this machine having an experience, you know? But I think it's strange to kind of put uh, experience in the brain. Like there's no reason to do that because that's like the whole problem of consciousness, isn't it? Like, yeah. does the brain produce experience or, or doesn't it? Like, mm-hmm. I'm not sure it's the right way of thinking. No, definitely not. I think the question is quite flawed because it's quite obviously no (laughs) I thought what was interesting about it was thinking um as machines develop as we get them to become more and more um capable of things like what do we owe them and what do they owe us to what extent do we can we use them for whatever we need them for and when do we need to start you know giving them any kind of rights (laughs) Mm -hmm. which is I don't know. To what extent, like, do you think that's legitimate to think of us as separate from machines? Because isn't it true that, like, we're merging with machines rather than them being, like, some something separate from us, you know, like, with, a, with the phone and stuff, and yet that's always in your pocket, and it's kind of like we're becoming one with machines rather than they're, like, rising up as some kind of alternate society or something? Well, I mean, Turing pulls loads of parallels between us and machines. He says that, like, our brains are just massive computers. You know, our DNA is like our programming and, you know, the information that we gain through experience is like, you know, the data that they get given as they're, as they're you know, turned on and stuff. So um, there isn't much of a difference in the way that we operate apart from I don't know, the fact that we're alive <laughs> and the machines aren't really. But how do you define life? That's an odd one, isn't it? Like yeah, to say that that, it always bothers me when people talk about like searching the stars for intelligent life. 
like life is contained in the body, but we can't really define what it means to be alive. Like what's the line between life and death, you know, like, well, is it when the brain turns off, but like there's still metabolic activity in the body and stuff like it's not, you know, life seems a bit of a fuzzy concept, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But I wouldn't, you, I would, you argue that machines are alive? Uh, well, would I argue that machines yeah. are alive? Well, I'd say that the reality itself is the only life, I think. that I think that everything's alive, in a sense. Right. Like, so, like, there's only one body kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, because you can't, like, really define the limit of your body, like, the line between your body and the world. It's a bit of an abstract line kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, so it seems to me, like, if you d define the body as one entity, it's kind of arbitrary, like... Like, you know, you can't go to the border between France and Germany and pick up the border between France and Germany because it's just an abstract line, isn't it? But I yeah. think that the line between, like, my body and the earth or whatever and the earth yeah. and the universe is similarly abstract, you know? Yeah, that's interesting. So I don't think life is partitioned up into little packets. Mm -hmm. no. It's that yeah. everything is life kind of thing. Yeah, that's just, yeah, yeah. yeah. Reality is life. Reality yeah. is I like the right okay mm. like being is living being kind of thing yeah so what does that mean for machines and like technology not sure really I mean uh, do you think that do you think that the human brain is like a computer um I can see I think it's quite a clever parallel to pull like the whole um programming and data and stuff like that I I don't know, because the way that they say that you can feed memory to a machine, so it's got infinite capacity for memory. If you keep building more, then it's going to have, you know, an infinite space for information. And then you can teach it to respond. You can teach it like anything, really, which is kind of how we would learn from experience from birth. Mm -hmm. But there's, I don't know, there's something different about the way our um, experience is and the way that we live our lives that just seems different to the way that machines learn, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't know what I think it could be. Um, I think it could be the capacity to learn without much input. So, I mean, I'm going to use the example because, you know, it was National Chess Day yet, like yesterday. Um, it was like the, the battle of like the two biggest chess engines. Um, Stockfish versus Alpha Zero. So, Stockfish, the first one I mentioned, um, was basically it was fully like programmed and stuff. Like you know, the inputs were put in. You know, the the inputs to evaluate positional, you know, positional weaknesses and piece value, whatever. Like it was purely programmed for chess. But Alpha Zero, on the other hand, was an AI thing, an AI program with the ability to learn, and it had to teach itself chess not be programmed it so and then after learning chess in a few hours it went up against the biggest chess engine at the time and just utterly destroyed it so one thing I think has been growing within machines is the ability to learn and as a consequence I think it's the machines that are becoming more like the human brain like they're not fully they're not fully like it like you know they can't develop feelings as of such but if you implant within, you know, a machine the ability to learn, I feel it will be able to, you know, fully be like a human brain, but on another level. It is interesting because they're now talking about um, trying to create robots that fear death. And like, that would be the next step to making mm -hmm. robots more like us. If we have autonomous robots that want their life to persevere, if they do everything they can to like keep themselves running and keep themselves alive um and that's what makes them kind of closer to maybe being considered to be able to think um but I don't know whether they'll be able to do that because it is, there's difference between trying to preserve their life and like fearing the end of it do you know what I mean yeah like but then again can you have both can you have both yeah. In a robot, I don't know if you could make a robot fear death. I don't know how you give something fear. 
or would you compare wanting um, life to continue? Would you compare that to the fear of life ending? I don't know. Um, I guess like what you could do is, um, you know, 3D printers? Mm -hmm. You could somehow 3D print, like, you know, the human brain and stuff and kind of put it in, and the nervous system, you could kind of 3D print that and put it in a robot and, you know, or at least something very similar. And because it would have, the hormones whatever needed to produce fear then you know it probably would you probably could be able to do that so at that point would we consider them people hmm i think we could if I, think that's we, possible. I think we could consider them a race of people so would you get married to an android <laughs> um, if you're sexy <laughs> um is i i wrote some like notes down about um robots that have been used like in society recently um and i don't know have you guys heard of spot the dog that boston dynamics no. No. it's basically like a robot dog it doesn't look like a dog i remember when i got told about it i got really excited that it was like this you know fluffy thing but it, it doesn't look like a dog but um I'm not sure why they created it. I think it was just because they're like robotic engineers and wanted to make a robot dog. But um, the NYPD used it. It's like $75,000 to like buy this thing as well. And um, they started using it last year and it very quickly got like got rid of because it was around the time of all the like questioning about what the police are really doing and why are they, where's the funding going? And then they've bought this robot dog. <laughs> Um, and they didn't use it for very like interesting things that it could have been used for like um, places where it's a bit too dangerous for humans to go so it could collect data and then bring it back to us but they used it for like a hostage situation which I thought was very strange. In what sense did they use it? How did they use I it? I think they like sent it in to like see what was going on but like if you're holding hostages and you just see this like yellow robot dog like trotting it in <laughs> what's that gonna do it might freak them out and like escalate it hmm. yeah so they just don't need distraction so <laughs> someone's desperate to use the robot dog i think in any situation yeah definitely there's um there was this youtuber called michael reeves who um who got his hands on one of the dogs and managed to program it to like sense when you put an empty cup on the floor and get it to walk over and piss beer into the cup. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's mostly been used for like silly things. Although um, I know construction sites use the dog to collect data to like see how things are going within like construction and like sewers and stuff like that. So that's where it's been used mostly for data collection. Um, but they released a video, Boston Dynamics, when they were um, still developing it, of the like developers kicking the dog around and like you know mm. being a bit abusive to it, and the response from the public was like, "Oh my god, I can't believe you're being so horrible to this dog," <laughs> but it's a robot. And then as soon as the police started using it in that context, everyone was like, "It's wrong. It's too futuristic. How are we going to get control over it?" So it's it's interesting our responses to it depending on the context. It really does affect the way that we see AI and technology, I think. Yeah, like what if you had a killer robot that the army was using and stuff? Like, would that robot be responsible for, for killing and stuff? Or would it be the guy that, you know, mm. if it was an autonomous robot and AI on the battlefield, you know, would you put it in jail or something? I don't know. Could <laughs> How do you bad? punish a robot? Yeah. I mean, again, that goes back to the whole nature versus nurture thing, because, like, with like these kinds of robots and stuff, it'll be when they gain autonomy, it'll be very much a nurture thing. Like they'll be fully conditioned into it by the army. Like the only teaching, the only parenting they'll get is, you know, being taught by the army to, you know, hate the infidel, hate, no, hate the <clears throat> hate um, the enemies of America to go overseas and invade them. Like, you know, they'll fully that will be what they're conditioned to. But again, that brings up a big human point. Um, are people like, let's say, Trump's, like, you know, racist white nationalist England fans and stuff, 
are they to blame or are they just a product like a product of their environment mm. like, it's, what, it's, it's interesting when you start thinking of humans as more like computational devices when like you think about the whole programming and data thing because um I think the word robot comes from a Czech play and like a play about robotics and AI and like sci-fi so in our etymology we can't separate the idea of robots and AI from science like science fiction um and if you start if you think about um the comparison you make to like villains in children's books they're always kind of like cold and mechanical and like um you know they don't think emotionally they think like a robot you know so then when you start thinking about that it's interesting when you see robots as villains and all of our villains are quite robotic you know so our machines that learn are they just like psychopaths you know <laughs> it, it's in it's 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 a bit scary thinking about it i'm not thinking the capacity for morality because like when you gain autonomy you gain the ability to assess whether the situation is you know right or not and that's why you know when people are scared of robots taking over the world i know i feel that's not really you know a fear because if you have a robot that's hyper intelligent and stuff and then can also reason or gain the ability for diplomacy and will realize that hey maybe it's good to live side by side with humans rather than invade them do you think you know, like do you think you could make a robot that has like an ethical a moral compass i mean with the capacity for learning if we build on that then I think you can, like, if you could learn morality, if you could just learn, you know, how to be a good person, then I feel you could. But surely it would depend on where you are in the world and the morality of the society that you're living in. Because I, I, mean, I, I don't think you'd ever be able to create a robot that can come up with its own, like, complex moral theory. I think it would just learn from other people. Well, you know, are we just learn from others? And we create our own moral theories? Mm. But do you so, like operate on a, on the basis of a moral theory, or are you not operating on the basis of your kind of innate feelings about something? You know, like when you when you act morally. Yeah, definitely that. It's just kind of a feeling, isn't it? And I don't know if you can create recreate that feeling in a robot. I don't know how you would even begin to try. Mm. Where do you think that feeling comes from? Do you think it's like evolutionary biology or something else? I don't know. I feel like. It's not an experience that's um, limited to humans, because you see in you know the animal kingdom when you know packs care for each other, mm. and you know there's kind of um, societies in some animals, isn't there? You know when you see like packs of lions walking around, and you know who's leading and who's around the back and stuff like that. So I don't think it's um, solely human, but I do think it's it's a biological thing. Mm-hmm. You know, I think we're born with that kind of want to protect and be good. Mm. Or maybe not good, but, you know. Isn't it like... Like, it's shared. Life is shared. I think we all want to share life with mm-hmm. everyone. It seems a lot of it comes down to, like, your sense of identity, you know. And, like, we we have a sense of identity where we're kind of, we think of ourselves as one one being, like, I'm one human being, and then that's another human being, and I have to kind of interact with that other being. But, like, that, I think that's learned because I think babies, you know, they can't differentiate between, like, their hand and someone else's hand. You know, they have to learn, oh, this is my hand, that's somebody else's hand. It's like yeah. an identity thing. And so we, like, feel like machines should have a certain kind of identity like a machine is one machine and it should feel like oh this is me and that's another thing but you know I think that that's kind of like a social I think we'll get confused between reality and our own kind of social conditioning you know Mm. so do you think robots wouldn't be able to differentiate between themselves and others I just think that 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 idea of like myself and somebody else is a kind of socially conditioned belief you know really yeah I don't think that there's any reason to suggest that you know, because, like, if you think about it, like, half of your lung is on the trees, isn't it? Like, you know, like, the the system of the Earth's 
you mm-hmm. know, cycles of energy. It isn't partitioned into like little packets. You know, it's all one kind of flow that flows through the body. It's not like there's the body and the earth, you know, and so there's no reason really like in science to say, this is me, that's someone else, because it's all kind of one system that you can't really draw hard lines between kind of thing. Mm-hmm. You know, so like when you're trying to program a machine, you're programming it to feel, you know, like when we're talking about like, will a machine want to cohabitate with human beings? But I think that that kind of idea of differentiating between robots and human beings and and, and dividing the world up into like in that way is a kind of human idea, really. Mm. You know? Yeah, I think that's what I mean by the um, sharing life I don't know I I agree with you I think but um it's just confusing when you try and add robots in because we the reaction from humans is just going to be so massive if if there was ever to be a robot race or something you know um I don't know if you'd find people that would just be like yeah this is life and we're going to share it with with these robots that now exist I think we're far too proud so many people are far too defensive. Um, I just don't think it would work. I don't think people would 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 want to do it. I mean, even just using like the robot dog in the NYPD was too much for people, you know. So I don't know if we don't even if we can possibly make robots that are um, autonomous and you know have the capacity to think and feel. I don't think it would ever get to the point where there was enough of them for it to be a race or properly integrated into our lives because people wouldn't have any of it <laughs> changes though like think about how let's say we viewed race 100 years ago versus how we view it now like you know we still have issues but 100 years ago it was basically like you know Jim Crow it was basically mm. segregation of the norm um we viewed let's say Indians as just you know scum or whatever so I feel something that we could see a society change or we could start viewing robots as people rather than, you know, the other. Mm. So I think not now, definitely not now we couldn't ever view robots as humans, but I think with societal progression, we certainly could. Yeah, that's, I think at the end of my essay, I'm like, you know, it's it's all a what if, you know, (laughs) you know, maybe one day, but for now it just seems so far away (laughs) um yeah because I mean people were afraid of computers and phones and everything weren't they and now we've got mobiles all the time everyone's got a mobile really um because it's hard to function in our society without it but like you know 50 years ago no one had one so maybe yeah maybe you're right maybe we will have a whole race of robots (laughs) what if what if human beings are the reproductive organs of the machine you know over mind or whatever you know oh. what if our destiny is to you know Crazy. create the robot you know That's God. Crazy. yo that reminds me of this creepy thought experiment i heard about the other day have you have you guys ever heard of something called rocco's basilisk or not mm-hmm. oh you, so you know what you know what harry mm-hmm. yeah. um basically it's widely considered to be like an info hazard because I mean, the mere thought experiment will give quite a few people like an existential crisis. So, <laughs> so let me just drop this info hazard. Let me just mm-hmm. um, give people an existential crisis for the day. Um, so basically, <laughs> um, what happens is um, you have the idea of, quote me if I'm wrong, Harry, but um, this imaginary basilisk and stuff, this imaginary, like, you know, higher level robot, but if you don't bring it into being, if you don't try and bring it into being, like, you know, um, it will just obliterate you. I mean, and I think that now that you, if you know about the robot and don't bring it into being, then it will just completely annihilate you upon its creation. Is that the thought experiment, Harry? Like, um, we could create a robot that would uh, vow to destroy everybody that wasn't uh, involved in its creation, it's so that isn't it? So it's something yeah. like, uh, so it could it could recreate you in like a test chamber and then torture you forever if you weren't mm-hmm. involved in its creation. Yeah. So you have to, 
be involved you have to devote your life to creating this robot because if you don't then it's going to imprison you and kill you or something like that mm-hmm. yeah that's the one now that you know about it, <laughs> I, think it won't, I think it won't do it to people that don't know about the creation of the basilisk only to, to people who now know about it <laughs> <laughs> oh no now i'm involved <laughs> Who would create it though? I don't understand who would be like, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's do that. Um, I don't know someone, some mad guy who wants to advance quote unquote science, mm. wants to see how far we can push AI, I guess. Yeah. Wants, I'm guessing he'll want to create like the strongest AI ever or something and then can sort of go sentient um, and imprison all the people who weren't involved in this creation and you know, it will help the people who were involved with it. Seems to me like we have to create the AI because, um, you know, like how the speed of like genetic change is so slow. And then like the speed of our change, like when, when we invented culture, it allowed us to like preserve information through generations so that we could change like culturally, like a lot faster. And if that rate of change is going to increase, you need to kind of move into a robot kind of intelligence because it's like you were saying about the chess thing where that, that, that machine learned chess in like a few hours and then it became the best chess player in the world, you know, and no human can compete with it. You know, like if we're going to accelerate like the rate of change of human advancement, you have to kind of move into a machine world, don't you? Because biology is kind of too slow to adapt with that rate of change, maybe. Or maybe I'm underestimating biology. Well, it's interesting because we're in such a like uh, an age of information. Is that what they're calling it? Like where we are now, and mm-hmm. the ra- the rate at which we've gained all the information we now have is just so rapid that when it does eventually slow down, because there's got to be a point where, you know, suddenly the information isn't coming in quite as quickly. Um, like what is going to happen? You know, when we've made all these amazing robots and like we've conquered space or whatever, you know, what what's gonna what are we going to do? Are the robots just going to take over? If we've got robots to do every single job that we ha- we do, are we going to be able to just lie in the fields all day and like get sunburned? <laughs> I mean, this sounds pretty nice to me. People get afraid of it. And I just think if they do it all for us, we can just chill out, you know? Well, that hasn't happened so far, like with the factories and stuff, where like they've, rob- yeah. like they've put the robots in the factories and we still seem to have to work a lot, you know? Although maybe that'll change, like in the future, you know, as things become become more robotized, or maybe yeah. it'll become disto- like a dystopian nightmare where we're forced to all become like marketing marketing executives or something. And, <laughs> I don't know. Perhaps there's no need for real work. I really, I think there's very few um, kind of service jobs that robots couldn't do, but I don't think robots could be artists or, no. you know. Musicians. Like, unless they unless they gained the capacity for creativity, they couldn't yeah. necessarily do it. Like um I think um you can use savants as like, a comparison guide. So you know Stephen Wilk here, the guy who can paint entire cities just by looking at them. Really? Yeah, so what happens is um what people do is um, they'd get him to go up in a helicopter, look at like let's say New York, and then he could draw the entirety of New York. Wow. But the trouble with him was that even though he could draw, like, he had this amazing talent and stuff, he wasn't the best artist because he didn't have that intuitive creativity. He just had a photographic memory. Yeah. So stuff like artists and musicians, you would require that creativity, which as of now, a robot couldn't really, you know, Mm -hmm. have. It couldn't really acquire it. And where do you think that comes from, that creativity? Why, why is that just the province of human beings? I don't know, I guess it's some, I mean, I don't know, I'm not a neuroscientist, but I guess it's some aspect of the brain which, you know, allows us to have, like, you know, intuition, to, like, you know, relate our experiences, to not kind of, <clears throat> to focus on less, like, information and more, I don't know, creativity, like, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm lacking clarity here, but, like, so you think it's purely neurological? Like, you think that it's just a matter of time before machines develop that ability? 
yeah, I think I think he could develop it, but not at this stage. Like, I mean, also, I feel they could have some success, but it wouldn't kick humans out because like people still be attracted to this human artists and human musicians exactly because they're human. Like, there's examples of um making uh, an AI read like. 5,000 different children's books or like 5,000 different poems or plays and then um, programming the, the AI to then recreate one of them or like a, a new version of it and I've seen I remember reading a play it was ages ago seeing one that a robot had written and like you couldn't really tell that it wasn't a person who'd wrote it um, because it, the amount of data you can like feed a robot in like you know a minute and then it can reproduce um, something very similar. You know, all it needs to learn is the structure of storytelling, plot devices, you know, characters and stuff like that. And then there's nothing really stopping it from making TV shows and, and poetry and stuff like that. But that's, I think that is different from creating something on your own, because that is just a kind of really, really advanced way of copying, I think. Mm -hmm. But then everyone says that nothing these days can really truly be original. It's all inspired by something. So maybe we are just copying as well. We just don't know it. Mm. Like everyone has their inspirations. Like everyone, like even the, the most like abstract of, let's say, filmmakers and stuff, like even those, you know, those guys who make the most abstract, like avant-garde films, mm. they're still influenced by like, you know, avant-garde filmmakers, for them they still remember like you know they still studied film and stuff so within creativity like there's no such thing as like you know pure intuitive creativity there's still you know experience we still learned from something still learned from our predecessors but even even like Mozart who we could say is like the biggest creative musical genius of all time composing symphonies at the age of five like he still learned from his predecessors. So I feel, although we may claim it's different, what the robot's creating the plays and stuff, it's not fully, or at least it won't fully be different in the future. What do you think about the idea of like a soul, you know, that human beings have a soul and robots don't? What would you make of that? I don't know. I'm a bit skeptical about the whole soul thing. Um, I'm not sure I believe that individuals have this kind of soul within them. I feel, I, I think that like, I don't know. Yeah, no, I don't, I really don't think we have a soul. <laughs> not in the, not in the way that most people say like, you know, soul is who you are and it continues on after you die. And, you know, that's my soulmate, that kind of thing. I don't, I don't really think that is it I think it's all kind of life and experience and it's all kind of one within this big thing you know mm. I don't, I don't what do you know. think happens when you die worm food I don't really think anything happens <laughs> nothing <laughs> mm -mm. Mm. I wish I believed in something if someone gives me a convincing enough story then maybe I'll stop being so horribly skeptical because it's really boring not believing in anything <laughs> so you think that experience in, in our life is totally generated by the brain um yeah i think i do i think so mm. i still think we're all part of life i agree with you in that um it's all constantly happening and it's always it's you know we're all within this one big life that is existing and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know. It's all constantly changing, isn't it? Everything. It's all. And so just because I exist now doesn't mean I'm going to exist tomorrow, you know? Mm. I don't think necessarily that my energy perseveres beyond my death. <laughs> like energy, like, like, like physical energy, like, uh, the energy that makes up your body. I mean, mm, yeah. True. Well, obviously it's going to go somewhere, but that's not me anymore. That mm. won't be me experiencing anything. That's just going to be 
my what is the like the life that is left in me going into the earth and, mm. you know so your your sense of personal identity then is a kind of illusion like there's not any kind of real you in the sense that like this is mine and that's not mine kind of thing this is my hand that's not my hand um yeah kind of i we're all you know and i feel like i've got this is mine my body and my brain or whatever but it's not it's still a part of everyone else that's alive and mm. everything else that's alive and the earth and everything you know yeah <laughs> i've never really like come up with a proper theory about what i think about this so whenever i talk about it it just sounds like nonsense <laughs> I don't know. yeah i don't know not as right, really. I like to think I'll go to heaven and meet God or whatever, you know, and play chess with him or whatever. Mm-hmm. Probably unlikely. So, if we make robots that can think and feel and learn and everything and do it all, and they can create art and all of that, does that mean that they can die and go to heaven? Mm-hmm. And we'll be. Say that heaven does exist for this. <laughs> well, can... Sorry. <laughs> uh, it'd be interesting to ask a Christian, you know, like what they think. Like if if there were like robots walking around that were talking to people, you know, would those robots be have a soul? You know, mm-hmm. it's the same with aliens. You know, do aliens have souls? Or do, you know, like from a Christian perspective, I mean, you know, yeah, <clears throat> it depends what God values, because. And if God values, like, you know, the way you live and stuff and your actions, then you probably would, even if it didn't have that kind of metaphysical soul. Like, um, I mean, another perspective of that, everything has soul, like every single part of the robot, like, you know, every single thing around us has a degree of, like, you know, soul to it. Like, so I think with that, you know, robots in the future, like when they become let's say robots gain the same autonomy, like autonomy as humans and stuff, um, I feel maybe a more panpsychist, like if we still even have religion, a more panpsychist approach will approach the forefront because it'll kind of include robots in that discussion. Maybe like even Christianity will be shift to a more panpsychist like lens. What's that? Like basically, you know, like kind of everything has a soul, everything has consciousness to to a degree so you know this kind of beer has consciousness or soul or whatever so i feel maybe like we could see a shift even in what heaven means with the advent of like robots but then what would go to heaven because i mean are you saying that consciousness is a fundamental property of 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 matter so then what would go to heaven like subatomic particles i mean they could well, I guess. The subatomic particles die? Mm. Mm. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not, I think that there's problems with panpsychism, isn't there? Because aren't, isn't us thinking about subatomic particles just like a kind of story that we tell ourselves? It's not like there's really like little subatomic particles swimming about with little packets of consciousness. I thought that was just like a way of thinking that we use to, to understand things. You know what I mean? Like how an electron is just like a cloud of probability. It's not really like a little uh, thing that's floating. Oh, yeah. You know? So uh, also like that panpsychism thing, like I, I was watching something about it and it was there's like a problem as to how like the little bits of consciousness would combine to, to form like a big consciousness. You know, the combination problem, like how they would come together to produce one big subjectivity. Elaborate. Yeah, uh, well, you know, like if if uh, an electron or a particle has consciousness, like like in the same way it has mass or charge, like mm-hmm. how because you don't experience yourself, you experience yourself as one subjectivity, one consciousness. So how would these little bits of consciousness that are that are properties of like fundamental particles combine to form your larger consciousness? And that's like a problem with panpsychism, mm-hmm. I think, is that that would have to be explained. The combination problem is called. Because we're made up of everything. 
So there's, do you, is that what you mean? Yeah, well, because it's a problem. It's like the problem is like the hard problem of consciousness. Like, how is the brain conscious? That's the problem. So, mm -hmm. panpsychist says, well, it's not that the the uh, consciousness is produced by the brain. It's that consciousness is a fundamental aspect of matter or something. But then the problem is, well, how do you explain the generation of large consciousnesses from these little small consciousnesses that are yeah. attached to uh, fundamental particles? That's very interesting. I've never heard of this before. Mm -hmm. I guess it's like, um, you think, I guess you could maybe say, um, you can't tell me if I'm wrong, but you could say like, it's kind of like a big Wi-Fi tower versus like a little Wi-Fi tower. So the big one will have more interconnecting signals. So it will create like a greater signal, will kind of create a greater consciousness. Yet that one singular bit of the Wi-Fi tower can't do it because it's not working in tandem. So I guess the connection of the different consciousnesses creates one big one. I don't know. Yeah, I just say would you you know like a panpsychist scientist or whatever would have to explain how how mm -hmm. they combine how these consciousnesses combine like you're saying with the how they would resonate with each other and and how it would they would have to show how you form a big consciousness from these little ones mm -hmm. working together. Well. How should we conclude? Have we got any concluding statements? Any more points that we would like to explore? I don't think so. I just no. think that robots can't think yet. That's what Not I yet. think. <laughs> well, okay, good conclusion. I'm on, <laughs> I'm on the robot side and I think that the robots can. Um, really? Yeah, now? Just, wow. Just in case, you know, they try and get back to this for insulting them. <laughs> I'm, I'm robot overlords or whatever. I just want to be on the record that I'm on the side. <laughs> just, just in case Rocco's Basilisk get me, like, you know, gets me. I know you're a G Rocco's Basilisk, you know, like, I know <laughs> you're, you're yeah. a real one. So, yeah, if you need me to help make you, you know where I am. Mm -hmm. <laughs>